Today we're going to take a look at OXLC, which is Oxford Lane Capital. It's a stock that's pretty popular among income investors because it's currently offering a dividend yield of over 16%, and on top of that, this stock also currently pays monthly distributions. I've seen a lot of comments from people who are curious about this stock, and I'm thinking that specifically right now would be an ideal time to talk about this asset class that OXLC is a part of. It's a type of investment that I think not too many dividend investors know a whole lot about, so we're going to take a deep dive into this stock, we're going to look at its past performance and how it generates its dividends, and I'll give my own personal opinion on it, as well as this company's peers. With that being said, let's go ahead and get started. First things first, I see there's often a lot of confusion about what exactly Oxford Lane Capital is. Some people think it's a business development company, and some people think it's an ETF. But the reality is Oxford Lane is a CLO closed-end fund. So it's a CEF, but unlike most CEFs that hold stocks and bonds, this fund holds something called collateralized loan obligations. As of the making of this video, there's only four funds out there that invest specifically in CLOs, with the others being Eagle Point Credit Company, ticker ECC, XAI Octagon Floating Rate and Alternative Income Term Trust, ticker XFLT, and OFS Credit Company, ticker OCCI. I actually covered this company in a video about four months ago because it currently offers the highest yield out of any CLO fund out there. Back then it was offering a yield of over 20%, but today it's now over 25%. A CLO is basically a pool of leveraged corporate loans that are bundled together and put into equity securities, which funds like OXLC buy. All of these CLO funds like Oxford Lane typically offer much higher dividend yields than most investments out there, with maybe the exception of exchange-traded notes. That's because these funds typically buy the riskiest CLOs out there because of their much higher dividend yields. On top of that, the amount of leverage that CLOs can use can be pretty high, which can either magnify gains or losses depending on the economy and how well the management team's been doing. Oxford Lane specifically invests in debt and equity tranches of CLO securities, which are collateralized principally by a diverse portfolio of senior loans. These funds were portrayed pretty poorly in the movie The Big Short, but due to more regulation since the financial crisis, they've been touted as being a more legitimate asset class. To see how well OXLC has been doing since their IPO in 2011, we'll expand their share price performance. You can see since being launched back in 2011 for $20 per share, it's now fallen by more than 71%. It's obviously not a good sign, but here's the crazy thing. Because of how high the dividend yield is for OXLC, if we calculate the total return for this stock with dividends being reinvested, you can see it's actually provided investors with a positive return. In fact, since 2011, it's provided an average annual total return of 6.31%. It's not great, there's plenty of other high-yielding investments out there that have outperformed it, but with a 71% share price drop, it would almost seem impossible for this to happen. But that's obviously how powerful dividend investing can be. On the surface, you want to ask how on earth could you make a profit from something that's lost 71% of its value. But again, that's just the power of dividends and how they come into play in this situation. Even if you chose not to reinvest your dividends, you'd still be looking at a positive return, although returns would have been significantly worse, with just an average yearly return of 2.61%. When taking taxes into consideration, it obviously wouldn't be a worthwhile investment unless you happen to be buying it inside of a retirement account. But we've seen that even though with a stock or a fund that might see really dramatic share price declines over time, it's entirely possible to still earn a positive return on your investment. But I think we obviously need to ask if this is a good idea. An important metric for closed-end funds is their net asset value, or their NAV, which basically represents the value of all the assets inside the fund. CEFs ideally trade around their NAV, although a unique aspect of closed-end funds is that they can either trade at a premium or a discount to their NAV. But a growing net asset value means the value of the assets inside the fund are increasing, thus the share price of the fund should also be increasing. If the NAV is losing value, then usually the share price for a CEF will also go down. As we've seen with some closed-end funds though, some can lose a lot of their net asset value, but not see a comparable share price decline if the dividend they're paying is sustainable. Ticker GOF is the perfect example of this, where you can see it consistently trades at a massive premium to its NAV. But for OXLC, looking at their September of 2022 investor presentation, which gathers information from their latest N-CSR form, we can see over time their net asset value for this fund has lost a considerable amount of value. As of September 30th, their NAV is currently at $4.93 per share, and you can see quarter by quarter it's been consistently going down over the last year. In just one year, this fund has lost nearly 30% of its total value. We can also see its share price over the last year has also fallen by nearly 30% to match this. And according to a press release by the company back in December, their NAV is estimated to have fallen again to now between $4.79 per share and $4.89 per share. When it comes to higher yielding investments like BDCs, MREITs, and closed end funds, even a steady NAV is better than a decline because you should be able to get a really high consistent dividend yield. But over the last few years, the stock's dividend distributions have also been cut from $0.14 cents per share to now $0.08 cents per share. 
Interestingly enough, it did drop to about $0.07 cents per share before they actually increased it in January of 2022. It's a pretty sizable fall from $0.60 cents a quarter, which is what this fund used to pay back in 2014. That's a loss of nearly 60%. But despite the recent dividend increase, the market hasn't been too optimistic about OXLC. In 2022, the share price of their stock fell by over 34%, which I just mentioned earlier, which was far worse than the average stock in the S&P 500. Last year, the S&P 500 finished the year about 20% down. If you remember in the beginning of this video, I mentioned how I thought right now would be a good time to go over this stock. The reason I said that was because of how CLO funds typically perform coming out of recessions. Even though we are technically still in a recession right now and we can only guess how long it'll go on for, if CLO funds continue to perform like they have in the past, then we typically see that they outperform the market coming out of recessions. According to the Credit Suisse Leverage Loan Index, these funds typically perform very poorly during poor economic conditions, but coming out of recessions, we can see that CLOs do much better during the recovery stage. And it makes sense since these funds typically invest in very poor quality loans, so they'd suffer much more during recessions. Poor quality borrowers are going to be much more likely to default, but when the economy recovers, then CLOs can see a sizable recovery when they're at extremely low prices. But we also need to address another important factor about CLO funds, which is their expense ratios. Believe it or not, and to a few people's dismay, I actually don't mind investing in a fund that has a higher than average expense ratio, even significantly higher than average. I know there's a lot of people out there who only invest in super cheap index funds, and I understand the appeal of them. I worked at Vanguard for years, and I know that these ultra-cheap index funds have a cult-like following to them. Odds are, though, if you're watching this video, you're either mostly or fully a dividend investor. And unfortunately, most of the diversified higher-yielding ETFs and closed-end funds come with higher expense ratios. This is because in order to get a higher yield, these funds typically need to be actively managed. Whenever you have fund managers who are really active in picking investments, or especially if they use leverage like most closed-end funds do, then it'll come with more fees. With CLO funds, they typically charge some of the highest expense ratios for any publicly traded investment. Oxford Square currently charges an expense ratio of 10.76% according to CEF Connect. It's one of the highest expense ratios for any kind of fund I've ever come across, and it's currently the second most expensive CLO fund. The one beating them in terms of cost is OFS Credit Company, which charges 13.02%. Eagle Point currently charges 9.71%, and XFLT currently charges 6.29%. If you try creating a simulation of how fees would impact your investment by using a calculator like the one on OmniCalculator.com and using a 6.31% average return from earlier, it would tell you that if your yearly expected return is exactly as your expense ratio or lower, then there's no point in investing in this ETF slash trust fund because you would not make any money. But this is misleading because the yield is net of the fees, so it wouldn't impact the dividends that you'd receive from this fund. But to summarize everything we've looked at, while OXLC does provide a huge dividend yield, it's still been a mediocre performer. As we saw earlier, it is possible to invest in this fund and still get a positive return. And if CLOs recover in the same way they did coming out of the last recession, then it's possible that OXLC might be an outperformer compared to other investments ahead. But in terms of being a long-term holding, then Oxford Squares continue to underperform. If I could suggest an alternative to consider, PIMCO has some funds that offer very high yields, monthly dividends, and are cheaper. Both PDI and PCM offer yields of over 10%, and they've never had any dramatic dividend cuts. Another consideration would be to instead buy the preferred shares of OXLC. I get comments from people wondering why I don't usually recommend this more often, and the truth is it can be a decent thing to do since the share price of preferred stocks typically don't move around a whole lot and they still offer high yields, such as with OXLCM. They can also be called though, which means they'd basically be delisted and you'd receive a certain amount of money for each share that you own that's outlined in their prospectus. Another downside to buying individual preferred shares, though, is that they're also thinly traded. So make sure that you never ever build up a large position in a preferred stock. Be sure to perform your own research and come to your own conclusions, though. With that being said, thank you all so much for watching today's video, and until next time, take care.